I love the world of 3D printing because there is so much great technologies that allow us to make really awesome things. But comes with that technology also is a pretty interesting history that I think we should jump in and really start to explore a bit. This may turn into a whole new different series of videos that look at the specific histories of the vast technologies that's in the 3D printing world, ranging from FDM to SLA to uh, LMO, L-O-M. Um, and you know what, maybe we'll jump into that at a later point. But today, we're just gonna talk about everything from the inception of this technology all the way to modern time. So 3D printing started as a concept in the 70s. This idea of layer-based manufacturing um, was really just thought of as a sci-fi thing. I mean, we've all seen a little bit of the Star Trek replicators making things on demand. That idea was such an early concept that it took another 10 or so years before a published work would actually come out. In the early 80s, a Japanese researcher by the name of uh, Hideo Kodama came up with this idea that he published uh, in a journal of layer-based manufacturing on SLA technology. And what he proposed was using a UV curable resin and a light source to cure this thing. Now, he didn't quite get his patent filing done in the, a lot of time frame of that one year, so no patent came out from that work. Then came uh, the 84s, uh, where two major events happened. Three French researchers uh, came up with an experiment that took on almost the same concept as uh, Hideo. And what he did was, uh, what they did was, uh, they actually went and did the experiment, filed a patent through a company, just to then later find out that the company had, um, not filed the patent, written the patent off essentially uh, due to lack of business prospects. That left a window open for a US inventor by the name of Chuck Hall that came in just three weeks after the French guys um, to, to file for his version of uh, resin-based SLA printing. And the patent was granted to Chuck Hall. He's known as the father of 3D printing today because of that particular moment. From the initial patent that was filed and granted, Chuck would later go and start a company by the name of 3D Systems in 86, the world's first 3D printing company to exist at the time. And it would take another one year for the very first SLA-based 3D printer to come to the world. Actually, the world's first 3D printer to come to the world, it was called the SLA-1. Now, in the 80s, a lot happened. Uh, in that exact same year, 87, we saw a fellow out of Texas Instruments by the name of Larry Hornback that developed the first DLP technology. That's the projector technology we know today um, and what we use to project images onto walls, um, large throw um, projections uh, into theaters, places like that. And that, that technology would later then become the basis of DLP-based resin printing technology, uh, really to speed things up a little bit. 89 was also another relatively important year for the 3D printing world. We saw Carl Deckard out of the Texas, the University of Texas uh, file for an SLS-based patent and get granted and got that patent granted for a company under the name of DTM Inc. Uh, that, that company ended up getting acquired actually by 3D Systems at a later point. Uh, Scott Crump, uh, co-founder of Stratasys Incorporated, uh, filed for a patent for FDM technology on that same year, and the, the patent would then be issued around uh, 92. And then we also saw Hans Langer, uh, who was the founder of EOS out of Germany, a company that was focused solely on laser sintering technology, um, start his company uh, around that same time. So, what was interesting with the 80s was that all these expansion occurred because of the interest uh, that came out at that early stage. Um, Chuck Hall went to, um, uh, will continue to develop his 
his, uh, his career and, and got quite involved in some things that we uh, have taken for granted today. The file format STL, uh, in short, stands for still lithography. He was one of the key individuals that put that whole entire file system together. And we still use it today as uh, one of the fundamental file formats that we use. It's also argued quite often who the real inventor is for 3D printing technology. Is it Chuck Hall? Is it Hideo? We don't really know, but I, I think from the perspective of a generalized you know, advancement of this technology, we can't discount the fact that Hideo Kodama did such a great amount of work early on to really springboard everyone else that I suppose you could accredit him with you know, being the original inventor if you want. The first inventor on paper is most definitely Chuck, but where does this Japanese researcher sit in the overall grand scheme of things? Well, let's kind of push forward a little bit. <clears throat> Ding. All right, moving on to the 90s then. Uh, the 90s saw quite an expansion of business activity within the 3D printing space. Um, in the early 90s, we saw EOS, the company, that was focused on laser sintering, bring out their first DMLS-based technology uh, in conjunction with a company out of Finland, Electrolux, uh, which then later got acquired by EOS themselves to really pursue and continue to build out that technology platform. We saw LOM-based technology, lamination-based technology, um, get introduced in, I believe, 91. And then by 93, we saw an inkjet-like technology that was introduced through MIT that would bind powder-based technologies together. Now, a year later, we saw the incorporation of Z Corp that built powder-based technologies, literally off inkjet technology, binder-based technology, that uh, would then later be acquired uh, by 3D Systems. And then in 96, we saw a company come out by the name of Sanders Prototype that built a wax-based um, platform that would then later be renamed into a company called Solidscape. So we saw a lot of activities in the 90s, a lot of business more set up, a lot of new technology introduced. I mean, even RCAM uh, got set up by, in 97, um, Object. Uh, geometries was introduced and established. I think it was by you know 98 or something like that. This period in the 90s was about expansion of industries, expansion of businesses, and new ways to think about 3D printing, how we can do things a little differently. Um, and a lot of new, I would say new ideas came about. And we would see that trickle over into the 2000s um, with the with the with the with kind of the, the same exact uh, acceleration that we saw in the, in the 90s. <clears throat> Ding. When we got into the 2000s, things were a little quiet for the first half, and then an interesting project came about by the name of RepRap. Uh, it's an open source project that was looking to bring 3D printing to a level that would be more affordable for small businesses and hobbyists that want the technology at their disposal. Uh, this was around 2005, and the project kept on growing over the next couple of years. Uh, a year later, we saw EOS, the same company that introduced that technology, uh, the DMLS technology, introduced uh, what was considered to be the standard for SLS-based printing um, at that year's convention. You know the. 2000s around 2006 to 2007, at that point, the industry was entering into an interesting era. It was an era where the industry was diverging into very, very specific markets. One that was looking to address the business market, the industrial market, uh, with metal-based technologies, um, reliable, repeatable, large format printing technologies. And then we had the other diverging uh, branch which was looking to build a desktop alternative, much more affordable uh, technology for the general public and the small businesses. This break off into what I consider to be desktop and industrial was uh, 
was and still is today uh, where the industry sits. Uh, this break-off spun out a significant amount of companies that was then able to set up shop, produce product, uh, and then let the larger entities like EOS, like Astratasys, like a 3D Systems to then focus on the industrial applications uh, and the industrial sector as a whole. By 2009, we saw what I consider to be the poster child company of 3D printing come around, MakerBot. They were funded uh, or founded, I suppose, um, during, that, during that year. Um, a couple years later, 2012-ish or so, we saw that we saw the, the merging of two companies, uh, Object into Stratasys. And we also saw some of the other activities in the industry also start to happen where it looked like it was consolidating. Uh, companies merging with companies, companies getting acquired by companies. And in 2013, we saw Stratasys purchase MakerBot and bringing the MakerBot product line into their ecosystem. And keep in mind, Stratasys invented the technology that MakerBot used, FDM. It was only natural that this merger would, would occur as Stratasys wanted to get into the, the two markets that they were trying to serve, that they were trying to expand into, that the industry was growing into, which was the industrial side and also potentially the desktop side. So between late 2012 and 2014, the industry was expanding at a rapid rate, trying to capture that desktop market space. But there was something missing, and there seemed to have been a missing link in getting over that chasm uh, for mass adoption. From our perspective, from the way that we see it, it seemed to be a lack of user knowledge, or at least skilled users that would be able to take this technology and really run fast with it. This lack of adoption kind of put the, the industry into a bit of a winter where everyone was trying to figure out where things went. We saw the mass media call out the fact that there was not going to be an adoption from a consumer perspective with regards to this technology. And we saw businesses try and shift their focus from the consumer market into markets that made sense. And we saw the growth within the education space, the engineering and design space, manufacturing space, of course, uh, prototyping space, and of course, industrial space, which is where the larger players went. Now, this is where it got a little interesting because the technology that was meant for the desktop was significantly more affordable to, well, anyone uh, um, at this point. You could buy, uh, as a business, 10 machines uh, of these desktop printers than you could one of these larger scale ones. But they had a specific purpose, and there was a use case that made them um, so much more uh, viable than you know, just owning one large size printer, and that was cost. The ability to prototype, to accelerate prototypes and, and product development through these desktop printers, just then later on through the cycle, utilizing the larger format industrial grade printers that has more material choices to bring the finalized product for testing. That was where the state of the industry got. This winter, I call it a winter, brought the industry back in to really think about how we can tackle application because it got to the point where so many 3D printers were being manufactured, so many brands were available, but there wasn't a clear use case. Where do you use 3D printing? In school, it made sense. In businesses that produce hardware products for prototyping, it made sense. But there wasn't a clear goal. And that was where the financial markets started to back off a bit from the 3D printing industry, the capital markets, I'm going to call it that. And it really put the industry back into a bit of its own to really try and figure it out. And uh, by, by late 2019, or was it 2020 or early 2020, we saw COVID-19 hit. And COVID-19 put the world into a bit of an interesting scenario. We had supply chain problems. We had manufacturing problems. We had a whole bunch of issues where supply and product couldn't be, couldn't be delivered in time. And what we saw was something that was quite astounding. The world turned to 3D printing. We had government bodies around the world, countries uh, seeking out entities that had the capacity for 3D printing. And we saw the 3D printing industry as a whole divert attention and resources 
to building medical devices in the short term until supply chain could come back up. Or in the best case scenario, change the way that we would be able to have dialogue with regards to manufacturing. All the face shields, all those reusable masks that came early, I think 3D printing with, without the 3D printing technologies, we probably would have struggled hard. And there's also the elements of the more extreme medical devices, the things that we probably would have never been able to put into a medical institution without testing, those ventilator splitters that we were able to test as a whole industry um, and to really deploy on some of these critical concepts that um, well, was, was made as, a, as, as, an, as, as an option uh, to um, what are the challenges that we were facing. So COVID-19 was just last year, right? It just happened. I mean, we're, in, we're only in January of 2021. And the industry seemed to have gotten a bit of a resurgence in terms of its, its activities, in terms of its interest. And this is where the story continues, I suppose. It doesn't end here. There are new technologies being made. We are now seeing the first desktop SLS technologies trickling over uh, into the small and medium-sized businesses. We're now starting to see more materials come around. We're now starting to see entities and businesses and government look at whether or not it's a good idea to invest into skilling up its citizens for a more advanced future with new knowledge base. So we don't know how the 3D printing world is gonna turn out. I mean, we have a sense with regards to where it's gonna go, but I think it's pretty paramount to, uh, to kind of take a step back uh, and take a look at what has happened in the past, where the trajectory is gonna go. And I think the 2000s, it's going to see an explosion with regards to how this technology is adopted, not just into the, the industrial side, but how it's gonna give the small and medium sized businesses a leg up when it comes to competing with the large players. Because I can't imagine what we're going to see when metal-based technologies trickle down and we can do just-in-time, personalized, customized um, offerings for the customers. I mean, not just for us, but for everyone out there that is looking to do that. So the story continues, I suppose. And perhaps we'll make more of these updates on the history and as it develops, perhaps a 2021 version and above, just to add on to this one at a later point. My thought for these series is to uh, dive into the kind of the high level history and then dive into how each and every one of those technologies got developed over time. So I'll be doing some digging and once I come up with some of the stories, uh, validate them, I'll be looking forward to sharing with you guys what they are. In the meantime, uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. And I look forward to uh, having you guys rejoin for other historical videos about the, the industry. So I'll see you guys then. Bye.